Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, the current and former Secretary of State dig into voting and elections. Plus, state lawmakers respond to President Trump's decision on DACA, the deferred action for childhood arrivals. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity has been formed to investigate possible voter fraud. And according to the Associated Press, 13 states, including Minnesota, are refusing to comply. Joining me in the studio to talk about this and other election issues is the Secretary of State, Steve Simon. Welcome. Thank you for having me. The recently formed uh, Presidential Advisory Commission issued a request to all states, and right. you rejected that request. Can you tell us why? Well, first of all, I'm in good company. This was a group of uh, bipartisan secretaries of state who said no, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, this is a really big ask, and, and I hope viewers know this. What I was being asked to do, and the other 49 secretaries of state, was to hand over, no questions asked, almost four million voter records containing very private and personal information, not just name and address, those things are public, but things like your voter history, things like social security information, driver's license information, military history, residency history. And I said no for a number of reasons. One is, I don't think when most Minnesotans registered to vote, they ever thought in their wildest dreams that their personal information was gonna end up in some sort of ad hoc database. Second, uh, more broadly speaking, I, I really uh, don't have a whole lot of faith and confidence in the trustworthiness of this particular commission it seems, at least, uh, at the outset, designed to somehow justify the president's as yet unproven, and I would say irresponsible claim that three to five million people, three to five million in the last election voted illegally, even if you think the president exaggerates from time to time, and it's only three million and not five million. Minnesota's pro rata share of that number would be about, would be north of 50,000 people. I'm telling you right now, there is no way that north of 50,000 people in Minnesota voted illegally. If it were even a fraction of that, we'd have an immediate special session, we'd have screaming six-inch headlines on every newspaper, uh, who knows what would happen. So uh, giving credence to that kind of exercise, particularly given uh, the leadership of this commission by two people who, by the way, uh, uh, I think are smart people and they're articulate spokespeople for their point of view, but they have a different, definite point of view, and that point of view is that they believe the president is correct. So I worry about this commission, that it was designed to and ultimately will deliver conclusions that are consistent with what the president has already said that he believes to be true, but which no one has found any proof for. And that really troubles me, apart from the obvious privacy concern. Some states are actually complying by releasing the information that is already publicly available. So why not at least do that much? Well, Minnesota law is pretty clear, and we're lucky. In other states, the, the waters are a little bit muddied, but in Minnesota, it's pretty clear. A Minnesota resident who's a registered voter can get certain published uh, public information, and it's pretty simple stuff. And political parties and candidates and campaigns buy this all the time. Our office sells it for $46. Its name, its address, it's whether or not you voted in a particular year. The commission is not a Minnesota a resident nor a registered Minnesota voter, but a registered Minnesota voter could order this for $46 and hand over that uh, that, that information to the commission, it may already have happened, we don't know. Uh, but I am really concerned about the depth and the intrusive nature of the other information. And I have to tell you, I've had people from both sides of the aisle come up to me thanking me uh, for that decision, and particularly uh, Republicans who, though they may agree with President uh, Trump on, on other issues, are, are thankful that our state has taken the position that that very sensitive information is gonna stay here in Minnesota. Well, this, you sort of addressed this. The Minnesota Voters Alliance has filed suit against you for rejecting their uh, request for public data. Yeah. Um, do you want to comment on that lawsuit? Well, I have to be a little sensitive here. As you can imagine, our policy in our office and many offices is not to comment on pending litigation. All I'll say is that we feel very comfortable with our legal position. Uh, we think Minnesota law is very clear on what is part of the public list and what isn't. But to the extent there's a disagreement, a judge will decide who's right, and that's why we have courts. There are apparently increasing percentages of the electorate who uh, their faith in the security of our election system is, is maybe not where we would like it to be. Um, where does that leave us as a nation when citizens are questioning the security of their data? Well, let me zero in on one part of the question, at least what I, uh, what I read into your question, and that has to do with a very 
uh, topical issue, and that is cybersecurity. In my judgment, that is the number one problem and focus and challenge when it comes to the security and integrity of our election system. Look no further than the headlines from the last presidential election. Allegations of hacking by Russia, other foreign nationals, even individuals in this country. I think our effort, our energy, our time should be focused on that issue, and mine is. So are the majority of other secretaries of state. What I would say to people in Minnesota is, we're in luck in one sense. The architecture of our system, the fundamental design of our system in Minnesota is quite secure. Keep in mind, we're still old school. We still vote pen and paper, right? Everyone knows who that who's been to a polling place. So you take a pen and you mark your choice on a piece of paper. Uh, it's very hard to hack a piece of paper or a pen. So we've got that going for us, unlike some of the other states that maybe some of your uh, viewers have, have seen in this last election that have touch screen voting machines with no receipt or paper trail. That would scare the heck out of me, and I think a lot of voters as well, because you don't know what's really going on. In Minnesota, we're pen and paper, and yes, it's true that you do feed that ballot into an electronic vote counter or, or tallying machine, but under Minnesota law, that machine must not, shall not, may not be hooked up to the internet at any time during the tabulation process. So fundamentally, we have a really good architecture. The threat uh, comes into play not as much in the polling place, but when it comes to the statewide voter registration system, which is a centralized database, which our office runs with input and help from the counties. And there the real challenge, as with all these other areas, is to stay one step ahead of the bad guys. And that costs money, that takes time and focus and energy. And in our office, we've spent the last two years really focusing on that. We have a brand new uh, cybersecurity uh, team in our office dedicated to looking at these threats. We are now working more closely with the Department of Homeland Security with state homeland security sources. We even last election hired a consultant to basically probe our vulnerabilities and advise us about how we can make things better, which we have. Fortunately, we were very good shape to begin with, but we took their recommendations to the extent they had them. And so we really are very watchful on these issues. As everyone knows from other pursuits, whether it's uh, you know large retailers or banks or others, it is about staying one step ahead of the bad guys, and we're doing that, and we're working with other states to do that as well. So from your point of view, Minnesota is doing well and is secure, and you're confident in our system here? I'm quite confident in our system, but I want to be realistic uh, for your viewers' sake. We're only as good as our, our, our last election and our, our last success. We can't rest on our laurels, we can't get cocky because the bad guys are crafty and they are clever and staying ahead of them takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy. So just because we have been safe doesn't mean we can just sit back. We have to be really vigilant and hardworking about remaining safe, using and not being shy about using those outside helpers and partners like the Department of Homeland Security, uh, state Homeland Security folks. Uh, there's no shame in seeking out a partnership with those other folks and we're doing that. One more question. Uh, the issue of provisional ballots came mm -hmm. up in the last legislative session, which means uh, voters' eligibility uh, can be challenged on the basis of citizenship, felon status, or mental competence. Minnesota does not allow for that. Many other states do. Um, what's wrong with putting votes in a maybe pile to just verify that they're legitimate? Well, you used a term there that, that I've used often, which is what provisional balloting would do is for the first time since state history in 1858 would create a maybe pile. There's the yes pile, we'll count these ballots. There's the no pile, we're definitely not. And then there's the maybe pile. And the reason I suspect we haven't done this in the whole state uh, history is because what this does is it, turn on it turns on its head the usual system we have for uh, claiming that someone's up, up to no good, which is we're putting the burden on the person, not the accuser. Whether it's the criminal context, the civil context, all sorts of contexts, typically in this country, it's one of the things that's great about America, is if you see, think that someone's doing something wrong, it's your burden as the accuser to show why they did do something wrong. The burden is not on them to show that they didn't do something wrong. And I, the problem that I and so many Minnesotans have with so-called provisional balloting is it does just that. It empowers the challengers at the polling place uh, who may or may not have the best of motives and intentions, uh, and it gives them the power over people who may very well be eligible voters. And then there's the practical effect. What happens with provisional balloting is someone's challenged. We don't know if that challenge is made in good faith or not. It's supposed to be. We, know, we don't know if it is or not. And then the burden is on the person being challenged to do something. In most of the legislation, it means they have to show up to some county office sometime within a week of the election, provide certain proofs or documents or something else. 
And what happens in other states that have provisional balloting is pretty predictable, and I predict would happen here if we ever had it, which is people don't bother. The election result is called for Office X or Office Y or Office Z. It's not a recount worthy margin, it's not close. And so the person who is told they have to come back in a week uh, to make their vote count says, well, why should I? All the races have been counted. My vote literally mathematically will not matter now, so I'm not even going to bother. And consistently and predictably, that's what's happened in other states. And I don't want to foist that on Minnesota voters. Keep in mind, we just got back to number one in voter turnout in the country. That was a big goal of mine, our office, many others around the state. We've always been at or near the very top of the list. We had slipped just a little in the last couple of elections. Our goal was to get back, back to number one, and we are back on top at number one. And in part, I think, we're back on top at number one because fundamentally, Minnesotans, regardless of party, regardless of where they live, they have a fundamental respect and confidence in the system. They might not like all the outcomes, maybe their candidate doesn't win, but they think it's honest. Secretary Simon, we've got to stop, but I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, appreciate it. Members of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus, legislators and supporters gathered at the Capitol to express solidarity with DACA recipients upon the announcement from the Trump administration that the program could be phased out without congressional action. Ending DACA today will affect nearly 800,000 young people, more than 6,300 6, who reside and work in our state of Minnesota. The young people who are recipients of DACA are honest, hardworking members of our community. As is required to receive DACA, they are law-abiding. They have passed strict scrutiny, security, and background checks. DACA recipients embody all the best qualities that we hope for and expect from our young people in our state. But DACA recipients are, are much more than that. They are people we know and people we love. In Minnesota, DACA has been life-changing, and the data, both here and nationwide, shows the following. 42% of DACA recipients uh, say that their wages have increased. I'm sorry, uh, wages have increased by 42% by people who have DACA. 95% of people who have DACA are either enrolled in school or in the workforce. 90% have either a state ID or a driver's license. 54% have purchased their own first car. And an amazing 70% of those cars are brand new. 12% purchased their first home. And 63% of DACA recipients say that because of DACA, they were able to move to a better job. They are in all parts of our economic uh, uh, economy. They are 21% in education and health services, 11% in nonprofits, 9% in wholesale and retail, 8% in professional and business, and 6% have started their own businesses. DACA is not ending today uh, or even on uh, March 5th, the, the deadline. Uh, people who have the opportunity to renew uh, should be doing that in the next 30 days uh, and look for more information on our website, on USCIS's website, about some of those details. Now joining me in the studio is the former Secretary of State from 1999 to 2006 and current chair of the State Government Finance Policy and Elections Committee, Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. Welcome. Glad to be here, Shannon. There are a couple of voting changes passed in the last legislative session that will take effect in 2018, including uniform election dates and polling places. So what do Minnesotans need to know about these changes? That they're very important to them. Matter of fact, the whole focus of this was about the voters because that's what elections are for, it's for the voters. It's for them to do the governing of the people, by the people, that's what happens on election day. So the most frequent complaint was the changing of polling places and the changing of voting dates. Very frustrating to people, and it results in decreased voter turnout. And so by having uniform election days and uniform polling places, it's a specific piece of legislation signed by the governor, now in law, takes effect December 31st of this year. And so the uniform dates are five dates a year, and the townships have their own special dates, so that is a sixth one. So the general election and the August uh, primary are two of them, mm -hmm. and the others uh, happen during the winter. And so we have May, we have April, 
and we have, I think it is February. Yeah, February. So they're mm -hmm. going to be the first Tuesday of those months. First Tuesdays of those months. And the polling places will be established by December 31st of the year before. Okay. And then those cannot be changed unless there is an emergency or if for some reason the polling place is not available. Uh, then they can change them, but otherwise they have to stay the same. And the school districts have to use those polling places. They cannot change them for a school election referendum, whatever that it may be. Uh, they have to choose out of that basket and also new in state laws. They have to consider geographical balance and also population. So those factors are new to school districts and um, are really a voter friendly and should result in some increased turnout. It will take a while for people to get used to the fact that that's really the case. And I would expect that there would be some information gotten out by each county election official, city or township that helps make sure that everybody knows that. But at least once you go to a polling place, that's it for the rest of the year. And so then people will know and there won't be any confusion and they can come out and vote. That's right. And my preference actually would have been even for the school districts to use all of the same precincts so that the one you're used to going to in August or November is the one that you get to go in any school district election. Mm -hmm. uh, but they disagreed with that the, through the school board association and so on, disagreed with that and they wanted to be able to combine some precincts uh, in those elections that they have that are separate from a regular election day, but then they have to use one of those five days and they have to use out of that basket of polling places that were established by December 31st, but they can do some combining mm -hmm. based upon geographical and population balance. Let's turn to the Presidential Advisory Commission started by President Trump, uh, led by Vice President Mike Pence to look into voter fraud. The current Secretary of State has denied the request for information, and I'm wondering where you, where you fall on that. I don't agree with the current Secretary of State in that regard. I don't think that as an administrator in the process of giving out election data routinely every single day, every single week, you can buy this data, public data, because who you vote for is a secret. That is the privacy issue. But who you are in regards to being listed on the voter registration list is not a secret. And so that is public data, and that is by statute and also by the court. So that is public data. And the motives are never been asked. I mean, when, when I was Secretary of State, the only question was you signed the form and said you're going to use this for political or for legal purposes. Sometimes law enforcement have a warrant, and then they have the right to access the data. But other than that, they do not. And so the um, selling of the data is there all the time being done every day. Now, the commission said, if it is legally available, uh, we would like the social security numbers and their actual birth date. Minnesota law does not allow social security numbers to be public data. That is private data in its entirety. And also their complete birth date is private data. But the year of their birth, 1980, 1990, or whatever it may be, that is included on the public information voter registration list. And so I believe the standing of the Secretary of State is that that which is public data, that which is regularly given out uh, as public data should be released to, the, to this commission. I believe that's the duty of an administrative officer. Questioning motives beyond that and saying, well, you might use it for this or you might use it for that, or I'm not confident in the person who's leading this and the predictable outcome and some of that. Do, does the Secretary of State quiz like that to the DFL party or the GOP party when they ask for the list and they buy those lists or any candidate? If you don't, then you shouldn't be doing it in regards to this either. It's an administrative function and that data which is public should be given to that commission. Let's turn to provisional ballots. Ballots, 46 states have them, um, which involves keeping challenged votes separate until they can be verified. Last session, you spearheaded an effort to start doing that in Minnesota. Will you continue that effort in the next legislative session? I would definitely continue the effort. I don't know if I'll do it in the next legislative session. It's more of a supplemental year, um, but I would consider that. However, the governor and the Democrats are adamantly, absolutely opposed to it. So I think the likelihood of that being able to go into law would be unlikely, and so that would make a difference. But I still believe, and when you have 46 states doing it, 
Uh, and several of them are also same-day voter registration states, which do have an exemption in the federal Help America Vote Act law, but several other states have done it as well. It's just a plain, a really good practice to do to have provisional ballots. It's a fail-safe, it's a backup, and uh, also the way I had written the um, provisional ballot law was unique in regards to um, the fact that those who are challenged due to felony status, guardianship status, residency status, um, citizenship status, any of those constitutional legal requirements that are there for voting, that's administratively challenged through the county auditor's office, the county election official. So that's placed on administratively. So we realized that we could administratively remove the challenge without the voter having to come in. So that was one of the concerns. Some, in some states, if it's challenged, then the voter has to come back. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that in, in the legislation you tried to push last session, that was not going to be a criteria. Is that correct? It wasn't because we did a very limited uh, set of voters, and that is those who are already challenged for some legal purpose, uh, information from the courts, which is accurate, information from the Department of Public Safety, which is accurate, information from the Department of Corrections, which is also accurate. Residency, they say they uh, send out a postal verification card when they voted same-day registration the last time, mm -hmm. and the card came back as no such address or no such person mm -hmm. living here. Then that challenge, if that can't be resolved by the county administration official, that challenge is placed on that voter's record. Okay. Well, to come in and just say, I swear, it's right, and then the postal verification card comes up back again. You know, that is not right. I mean, you right. either live there or you don't live there. Right. And so it's, it's just a function. But so we, because we did administrative challenges only, uh, other voter registration um, issues are identity, who you are. Right. And that is more of a photo ID question. So other states who have a question of, are you who you say you are? And my question is, how do you know without right. a photo ID? To turn to a more philosophical question, if increasing percentages of the electorate no longer have faith in the security and sanctity of the voting process, where does that leave us as a state and even as a nation? I think absolutely crucial to the whole voting process is that confidence. We give confidence through the election process in recounts. If things are within that half percent, then we recount and we do it very well and we make corrections afterwards. What we don't have is in voter registration. In voter registration, we do not have that same level of integrity, and so people don't have that same confidence. That's why those questions keep coming up. So there has to be a balance of integrity and accuracy and privacy. Those are all things that are very, very important to the election process. And when you increase that, and when you make that a focus, you do increase voter turnout. While I was Secretary of State for those eight years, Minnesota was number one in voter turnout for all eight years. And not only that, our young kids increased their voter turnout as well, higher than it had ever been in the past, and has not really continued, because that is absolutely crucial to turning out the vote and having good high voter turnout is confidence in the system. But it has to be the entire system, not only recounting the ballots that are in the ballot box, but who gets the ballot is also important to make sure those who should have them get them, those who should not, do not. Very simple, easy to vote, hard to cheat. One last question. Although a constitutional amendment in 2012 was defeated that would have required a valid photo ID be um, shown when voting, you've said that you're still in favor of this um, common sense policy, is what you've called it. As some of these laws have been struck down in other states by the courts, most recently Texas, have your views on this issue evolved at all? I would say not the concept of the fact that saying you are who you are but then having your ID with you to also prove it. The version of the ID, uh, what kind of IDs, I think the courts have said they need to be multiple, they need to be many, so that whatever qualifies as proving your identity has many tools to do so. And I think that's a very important consideration. It's interesting that the U.S. Supreme Court upheld photo ID in the state of Indiana. I think they're the model to use. I think the broadness of their IDs that you can use, the timing and the other issues involved with that are valid. And by the way, recently a poll was done in Minnesota, and the support for photo ID is still very high and very strong. But it needs to be written in a way that complies with court challenges. And court challenges will still come. 
But I think we can learn from all those other states, and I'm carefully keeping an eye on all of those other states for what are those conditions that do pass muster in regard to supporting a photo ID, because the citizens certainly do support it. Senator Kefmeyer, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Pharmaceutical experts testified recently before the Senate Select Committee on Healthcare Consumer Access and Affordability as the panel continues to seek ways to address the rising costs of healthcare. Virtually everyone needs, has used, or will use drugs in their lifetime. When we have a manufacturer, someone who discovers a new drug, A, we, we value that, we appreciate that, we applaud them, and we award them a, uh, a monopoly through either a patent or exclusivities or uh, simply through uh, FDA only approving one product until another one can come along. So there are monopolies established in this uh, arena and monopolies don't price using normal market mechanisms. There are extremely high barriers to entry into this marketplace for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, the cost is uh, enormous to find a, a truly new therapeutic agent and bring it to the market. We have sort of a moral obligation with these products as a society to ensure that people who need insulin get insulin. Not the case, say, with television sets and so forth. Uh, and so I want to really make sure I understand uh, specifically with the EpiPen and insulins, because I think those are clarifying cases uh, where there really is a, a, an, an immediate medical and absolute life-saving need to make sure that we provide those medications to patients. I want to understand fully why those prices rose so dramatically over the last few years. You have them classified under old drugs and said their prices rose because of that. Uh, EpiPen, I think, had a monopoly for a while, and I think I understand why that raised the price. But you said the insulin still had three different manufacturers and the price was rising dramatically nevertheless. Right. Can you illuminate that for me? They're competing to get the doctor to prescribe it. They're competing to get patients on their drug. But they're not competing on price. The market insulates them from competing on price. Again, because we've awarded a monopoly and exclusivities that go on for long, long periods of time, and you don't have market-based prices when you have monopolies. It takes me back to one of your first slides where you talked about the market for drugs being unique, and you referenced the monopoly, the high barriers to market entry, the resources not easily transferable. Yeah. Uh, it, it makes me think of our utilities. It makes me think of yes. Excel. Uh, those are the same kinds of things. It's a monopoly. It's hard to get in. You don't, you know, you don't start an, a new electrical company in, in your garage, that kind of a thing. <laughs> What's the solution? Actually, the Canadian government uh, for a number of years has operated what they call the PMPRB, the Patent Medicine Price Review Board. When a drug company is going to launch a product in the Canadian market, they have to submit their pricing information to this board. The board reviews and, is, and evaluates with appropriate uh, academic and, and economic information. Is this a reasonable price for this drug and versus the alternatives? Uh, and if it is, then they allow it to come on the market and at the price that they've asked for. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching. Thank you.